Welcome to the Organic Wine Podcast. I'm Adam Huss, coming to you from Los Angeles, California. Thanks for listening. The sponsor for this episode is Centralis Wine. Centralis is an ecological winery that I started to protect or benefit the environment and my community with every business and winemaking decision. I envision a wine world in which humans are the students and servants of the non-human world, regenerating and protecting the vitality of ecosystems and promoting the diversity of life through wines that uniquely and deliciously reflect local abundance. Centralis wines feature foraged prickly pears, urban perennial polyculture wine garden produced grapes, gleanings from urban fruit trees, dry farmed century old vines, and organic and biodynamic viticulture. If this sounds interesting to you, join our email list, learn more, or join our wine club at centraliswine.com. That's C E N T R A L A S wine.com. My guest for this episode is Eric Schatt. With his wife and partner Deva, Eric is the owner of Redbird Orchard Cider in the Finger Lakes region of New York. That's Redbird spelled R E D B Y R D. I love that Deva and Eric put the orchard first in their name and in their philosophy of cider making. In fact, Eric is an apple breeder and preservationist. He grows over 150 varieties of apples in his four acre orchard and is cultivating trees propagated from the wild and then planting from seed and crossing with others. He also, you know, on the side makes a little delicious and unique cider. Eric tells us how all that diversity in the orchard provides reinforcements against the unpredictable nature of, uh, nature and how it can also provide consistency to the cider. He gives us an intro to grafting and he discusses his unique approach to making cider as well as his desire to promote freedom of technique and experimentation in the cellar. Redbird has been certified biodynamic for years but Eric and I discuss how he came to be aware of biodynamics troubling origins and the beliefs of Rudolf Steiner. While Eric is drawn to the spiritual connections in farming that biodynamics brings attention to. We discuss why its history has caused he and Deva to question whether it's something they'll continue to support via certification. This is a succulent conversation on many levels because of Eric's thoughtfulness and curiosity about the many unknowns that are part of farming and making wine in our little corner of the cosmos. I have to make a disclaimer uh, about a semantic faux pas I make right at the beginning. I make a comment that Eric started in wine and then moved to cider. I should have said he started in grapes and moved to apples, another palm fruit. One of the important things I'd love to achieve with this podcast is an expansion of understanding of what wine is and that it's not just a beverage made with European grapes. Eric was kind enough to not correct my lingual slip into an inaccurate schism based on an overly narrow ideological framework, but... I just wanted to mention that I'm aware of it and care to not perpetuate that kind of thinking with my language. So thanks and enjoy. Hi, Eric. Welcome. Thanks for doing this. I really appreciate you doing this. Thank you, Adam. I'm I'm happy to be here. Yeah, I'm looking forward to have a conversation with you because you have a unique background, I think, in that you sort of started in wine and are now in cider, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? Yeah, that is correct. Um, going way back, I worked at, well, I guess I, I got a I got a bachelor's degree at New Mexico State University, graduated in 1999. And in, in New Mexico, I, you know, was exposed to, you know, the pecan orchards, um, chili peppers, uh, vineyards, cotton, that kind of agricultural, you know, systems. And so it was kind of there that I first started thinking about viticulture. Um, upon graduation, came back to the East Coast where I grew up in Pennsylvania and started working for a small winery and vineyard in Pennsylvania. And that was sort of the beginning. So from there, made my way up to the Finger Lakes and um, really got steeped in grape growing, you know, wine grape growing, nursery management, uh, into the cellar, making wine. And um, that's really where it all started for me. So, I mean, I'm really curious, especially about, um, I'm, I'm from Pennsylvania as well, but I'm, and I'm, uh, you know, I know Pennsylvania wineries and wine and, and curious your thoughts about having worked there and also, but then also really the Finger Lakes area where, I mean, I don't know if you would agree with me, but it seems like the, the gold in, in you, where you are now 
are are the apples and and yet the investment has been in the grapes <laughs> um and i'm wondering what you think like if you agree with me or disagree about that and what you found and learned and, and what you brought out of working uh with the vineyards there which i i presume were I, i'm sure in pennsylvania you probably worked with some hybrids but in the finger lakes i'm guessing you worked with most mostly vinifera yeah um well it's interesting when i started working in pennsylvania which was i guess it was the year 2000 I remember going to a uh, an early like a, like a wine wine and grape growing conference in Pennsylvania and um, was shocked at the age of the people that attended and I was you know twenty whatever twenty three at the time and there was nobody there that was you know in that age bracket it was mostly older folks and mm. I talked to an extension guy there um, Mark Chen who worked in Oregon prior. And he he kind of got me going in a few different directions as far as who to work for, but he um, was so excited that there was a young person, <laughs> and and, <laughs> and and I think that's changed though because now twenty years later, I mean, maybe, you know, I guess I've aged obviously, but there's there are a lot. There's a higher percentage of younger people in both wine and cider than there was mm. twenty years ago, and I really think that's. Um, the change kind of away from the like traditional methodology into the exploratory. And I think that's like what you see with a lot of young winemakers in the natural wine slash, you know, pet nat style, you know, that, that kind of mentality. And that, that spills over into the cider world too, where we have kind of less restrictions on tradition and we're just sort of like wide open, you know, like I, I hear about people now making like wild plum apple Riesling blends and like all these <laughs> cool, you know, like, so, so I think that the, um, you know, the natural progression over the last 20 years has kind of favored, you know, a um, little more, you know, artistic flair. And uh, that's, that's great. Right. I, I think, yeah, I really think. Yeah. Absolutely. No, I I mean, I, I, you know, I approach things sort of from an ecological perspective as well. And it just seems like, you know, vinifera really struggles to thrive and needs a lot of help um, in, in the Northeast where, I mean, the whole East (laughs) basically. Um, And then apples, you know, are growing wild and thriving there. And it's like that, you know, the vision that I have for wine is this thing where you find what's doing well and, and, you know, and you make a unique, beverage that can't be replicated anywhere else in the world and i think i think that's why i get so ex- you know i mean for for anybody who's listened to my podcast they they may be beginning to wonder why i interview so many cider people and it's it's that vision where that i think cider is fulfilling in our time right now so much more than grapes are in this country you know because we're we're still just replicating a european model and grapes for the majority of you know the vast majority of the wine industry yeah. whereas in cider there's this real thing where people are making you know making cider from a single tree in the finger lakes national forest you know and that's just that's something you can't export or globalize and i love that you know i love that it's something that is built for that area that is you know that it grows out of that area and is so unique and specific yeah. to that area yeah um i don't know that's what i love about it but I, I you know but i yeah just wanted to get your perspective i think you you've learned some important lessons from working with with grapes in the finger lakes region too yeah. i mean what, what what kind of in terms of you know, I know you are a pomologist and orchardist, and I wondered just like how some of what you learned working with grapes translated into that. Like, what were some of the lessons that you took? Yeah. With you? Well, you know, so so now, you know, at forty five, looking back, you know, it's interesting when when you're you know first starting out in any endeavor, um, you don't really realize how impactful the early influences are. You know, who you work with, what you learn. And and so looking back, when I moved up here and worked for Herman J. Weimer Vineyards in 2003, 2004, um, Herman was very impactful on me, but I didn't know it at the time mm. because I was young. You know, I was just kind of just, you know, getting getting started. But I think what I really what I really learned from Herman was this um, like under deep understanding that 
what the way you grow the grapes and 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 now I see this the same for apples essentially whatever you grow with the intent to ferment um is the biggest influential part of the process like like what you do in the field how you treat mm. the grape vines or the apple trees how you how you fertilize them you know how you sing to them how you how you <laughs> how you look at them how you how you prune them how you thin the fruit whatever you do um that has that is the opportunity for the winemaker or the cider maker to to direct the outcome of the fermented beverage in the most influential way and right. and that is like such a cool thing i'm so fortunate that i learned that at a young age and i think that's because herman was like i like like i really respect he was as much a grape grower as he was a winemaker and he really loved both he was passionate about both and and so um so that that has always stayed with me and i still am very you know I think about that a lot as far as what I do in the orchard and how it, you know, comes out mm. in the finished cider. So that's, that's really, that's really fascinating. Um, the other thing, um, when I worked later years at Ventosa Vineyards in Geneva from 05 to 09, I worked with Rob Thomas from Shalestone Vineyards in the Finger Lakes. He was a consultant. So he was kind of the main influence for me as far as how to actually make wine. And um, just because... Um, because Herman, in some ways, was kind of closed. You know, he didn't really oh. give as much. <laughs> so it was more ancient of ancient German secrets. Yeah, kind of exactly, thing. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, but Rob was great at teaching me how to how to make wine, and um, and I I think his influences on sort of or his style in just sort of kind of the the opinion or the um, the idea of you know don't don't let yourself get too like you know, freaked out or upset, let the, let the natural process flow because, you know, mm. making, making wine from juice or cider from, from apple juice is a natural process that, right. you know, yeast uh, carries through with, and then you just have to kind of guide it. And I think that's right. a, a cool lesson to, to have learned also. Lovely. Yeah. And that's Geneva, New York, not yeah. Switzerland. Yeah. Geneva. Right. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Well, um, so let's talk about what you are doing now. So Redbird and I and what I love about this is that you your name really puts orchard right there before everything else. It's Redbird uh, with a Y, orchard and cider, or Redbird at uh, Redbird Orchard Cider. How do you? I mean, how yeah. am I saying which one is the proper one there? No, yeah the the legal DBA is Redbird Orchard Cider. Right. And so why did you choose that name? Yeah, you know that was um. That was mostly I give credit to to my wife Deva, who's my business partner. Um, mm. She it was really important to her to put Orchard in the name, and I think um, and and I, I I agree, but it's really um, just making sure right up front that it's clear that we are growers that we're in right. Orchard. Very cool. Yeah, I mean that's what I get from it, and I like that yeah. that emphasis. And you are not just growers, but you are kind of some inventive and uh like what's the word i'm looking for you're um not, <laughs> i was gonna say archaeologist but you're like anthologists or what, what's the what is the word i'm looking for preservationists maybe of yeah. these wild varieties like you're finding and propagating wild varieties you're you're planting from seed to cultivate you know new new breeds new cultivars of apple um can you talk a little bit about all of the things that you're doing with the orchard yeah um that's yeah. So, so going way back, I was fortunate to live next to an abandoned orchard and around that abandoned orchard were all these wild seedling trees. And so this was, you know, 10, 15 years ago. And I would, that, that was my beginnings of making cider was um, harvesting these wild and abandoned orchards um, in the, mm. in Burdett, New York. And um and I was shocked at how beautiful the ciders were. They're just like, and they're just, they were just full of like lively complexity and character, lots of acid and tannins, just like they had everything. And so yeah. I started grafting these varieties and I still do today. And that's, that's one piece is really kind of building, building the orchard over time. I feel like it's kind of a good exercise to think of an orchard as a, 
con constantly changing um, blend of varieties. And as you, you know, you work with new varieties, you know, some of them work, some of them don't. And there's this beautiful uh, technique that we have in orcharding that you can do with grapevines, but it's a little bit more difficult where you can top work or graft over a variety to another variety. So, mm. um, so I grafted in a lot of these wild cultivars into our existing orchard. And then I started grafting them onto rootstocks and planting them out in the orchard. And, and now I have at least a dozen, um, of course you have to name these varieties. If you're the, the, um, rediscoverer or the, um, you know, bringer or the, the propagator. So <laughs> we, we've named them. Um, and it's, it's really interesting in some regards, the, the wild mother tree is sometimes not as, you know, exacting in its transfer into a cultivated orchard. Most of the time it is, but it's like some of these mother trees have significant, um, maybe restrictions, you know, if they're growing like around rocks or, oh, or maybe right. half of the trunk got you know, destroyed by lightning or who knows what. Right. Um, and then you, you take, you know, a little piece of the sign wood and graft it into an orchard and all of a sudden like, boom, it's got all this power and it's much more of a vigorous <laughs> growing variety right. than you, than you saw in the wild. So sometimes it doesn't transfer, but the one thing that, that I, that I think does transfer every time is the disease resistance. And that's really, mm. I feel like the biggest um, gold mine is that all of these wild seedling apples that we're finding in New York, they grew up with the environmental conditions and restrictions that New York offers. And so the right. trees that, that survived and were able to produce fruit are essentially um, the allowed genetics to, to thrive. And so right. therefore, the selection process, the natural selection process has already been done, which is an amazing thing when you think about how long it takes an apple breeder to come to the same result. So, so taking right. these wild selections and getting them into the orchard has been, you know, a beautiful, a beautiful enjoying, enjoyment, enjoying task and um, continue to do that. And yeah. that's, and that's just the, the wild apples. Um, the other piece is doing some, some on-farm breeding. And, and I'll mention like, the the ultimate goal for me at this point is I I really want to establish a, an orchard that does not need any spraying can thrive and can produce not only cider fruit but culinary fruit. So in a way, you know, like can we can we um, harness the genetics and 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 create varieties that can produce not only you know fresh fruit but cider fruit without um, any organic and for sure not synthetic intervention. I think that would be an incredible, you know, progress forward as far as agriculture. And um, that, absolutely. And that's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so I mean, it's, that's, that's where that translation from the small scale can be, can become massive. I mean, if I, I would imagine that would be a, a huge boon to any, farmer who's yeah. thinking about growing apples um because the uh, yeah i mean just you'd, you'd finally be able to make money doing it <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah and I, th uh, I think the funny thing is is that i feel like we kind of were already there maybe 100 right. 150 years ago and right. the way agriculture has progressed unfortunately we lost a lot of that knowledge so um yeah the the uh the the acceptance and the affordability of synthetic chemicals has changed the varieties that apple growers grow. Right. And so, yeah. and so I, that's, yeah. And we're coming to the point now where the downsides of that are becoming more and more apparent. So therefore we have to, we have to change. At least that's yeah. my opinion, of course. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, and I was going to ask when you said, you know, these have grown up with resistance. Um, I mean, I was going to be like, well, so what is the reality? Is that, does that mean no sprays right now? Like for the ones that have grown from seed that you've selected? Um, or do you still, do you have to monitor and sort of keep an eye out for 
development of things or do you do anything preventatively? Because I know like if something does develop, it's probably too late with organic treatments yeah. anyway. But I mean, are you doing so what are you doing <laughs> and how, how disease resistant are these? Well, yeah, um, again, it's so so because I threw into that equation in my goal there, the need for culinary fruit, I still have a long way to go. Right. But, yeah. But from the perspective of of having the um, the lucky, fortunate reality of being able to throw all my apples into the press and um, and hide all the blemishes <laughs> that occurred right. the, on the fruit. That's, right. that's a real benefit. Right. So um, I, I feel like so. So I have like four acres of, of producing orchard, you know, which is relatively small. And I will say, fortunately for me, I'm isolated. So I don't have lots of big orchards around me that have significant pathogen buildup mm. that I have to that I have to be weary of. Um, but yeah, I my my current spray program is the biodynamic preparations um, this year, which right now we're we're at the end of June. So I've sprayed four times with copper and this product called Double Nickel, which is a um, competitive microbe spray. And, okay. and, oh, the other big part of what I needed to do this year was we had a, we, we've had in New York, um, a huge population boom with spongy moth and they love apple trees and they love oak trees. So untreated, they would, they would defoliate the oak tree, the wow. apple trees. So I had to spray, um, Bacillus thuringiensis, which is a organic, uh, BT, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, so, so that's what I've done this year. Um, and you know, maybe you can't get away with it every year. If you do have a, a population outbreak of a specific insect pest, maybe you would have to treat that in some years. But, um, I feel like, I feel like we're getting closer. Of course, the big, um, the other big question is where climate change will bring us. And right. if, yeah. if things are changing faster than normal then is it possible that some of the that the, that the genetic um you know natural selection etc won't be able to keep up or something like that so anyway right uh, no no well yeah. so i mean i think you also have it sounds like um you're also building into your orchard a, a potential partial at least solution to that in diversity if i'm right yeah. so you have like like I'll, just as a fun anecdote, when if you if anybody gets a bottle of Redbird cider, you know, and you're used to reading back labels that have like interesting descriptions about philosophies or sort of romantic visions of the farm and these kind of things, for you guys, once you get done listing your apples, there's barely room for the uh, alcohol content on the bottom. <laughs> yeah. the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> there's usually I mean, i'm joking of course but there's like you you know you list apples and it's like yeah. you could read for three minutes and get before you get to the end of yeah. them you know yeah, yeah. um so that's I, I i really like that in that sense of diversity and i'm sure that it helps in commercial sense as well because you you know you, some varieties might have a bumper crop one year or some you know and then have an off year and other varieties would make up for the difference because they're more consistent producer or things like that as well. Can, can you talk a little bit about that? What, what goes into diversity, the benefits of diversity? Yeah, that's, that's a huge piece of it. Um, so on our four acres of producing orchard, we have over 150 different apple varieties and, and, and yes, it is kind of a disaster and a mess at times, but <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, um, it's, it's also biodiverse, right? So um, just one very simple example. If if we have there, there's a lot of diversity in apples. There's there's you know fruit size, fruit color, tannins, acid, tree structure, um, you know the size and shape of the leaves, the bloom time, the you know propensity to certain diseases. There's so many variables, and so just to pick one of those variables out um, with bloom time, the earliest blooming varieties that I have in my orchard compared to the latest blooming varieties in my orchard is probably a good five weeks. So there's this, okay. so there's this huge window of bloom time. And um, here in New York, the two biggest threats <laughs> to the orchard yeah. are spring frost freeze on the blossoms and fire blight. And so mm. you get the spring frost freeze 
some years, and that'll take out the early blossoms. Right. And you get fire blight some years, and fire blight is a, a you you get more fire blight the warmer the weather is around bloom. So if you have a really warm bloom at the end of that four to five week period, those are the varieties that are going to get fire blight. So um, if you had both of those scenarios in one year, that would be a real big problem. But hopefully you can, you know, hedge your bets. And for instance, with this particular year, the earliest blooming varieties had no frost freeze. They set a beautiful crop. The late varieties were blooming during 85 to 90 degree weather, which is very warm for us that time of year. And they did get fire blight. And so though a lot of that fruit is not going to make it. So that's a great example of diversity in the orchard and how you can not essentially not put all your eggs in one basket. And, and, um, and there's so many other, you know, things that can go wrong, you know, pests, or or whatever, and it's good to have diversity. And from a cider making perspective, that diversity is another one of these you know beautiful things to work with. It's just like you know you have you know a hundred different shades of you know Roy G Biv versus five. You know, <laughs> so right. So, right. So you're really able to to work with that, and and so it, we, we need a. We need a bigger word than rainbow for, for uh, yeah. your cider. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's a huge um, benefit to a cider orchard. If I was a fresh fruit grower, of course, if I was, if I was, if I had a hundred different fresh fruit varieties and I was selling direct cons- to consumer at the farmer's market, um, that would be a really interesting farm stand. Right. But if nice. I was, if I was a, a fresh fruit grower and I had a hundred different varieties on four acres and I was trying to sell to a grocery store who was going to market my fruit for me, they probably wouldn't be able to handle that. So that's like the, um, that's the, the challenge, you know, it's much easier if you're a 500 acre apple orchard to have five different varieties and to be able to market them, you know, easily to, to a packer and, um, and that has its benefits and its challenges. And so this cider orchard, our cider orchard here is a huge, a huge blend. And I've seen the benefits as far as um, the many catastrophes that, that one can get growing apples. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, well, how, how do you make your cider? Do you want to talk a little bit about your cider making? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I guess, yeah, back to the apples there. If some people ask me, you know, how do you make Workman Dry, which is our um, kind of flagship cider, how do you make Workman Dry consistent every year if you don't get the same percentage of varieties every year? And so the answer to that is that when you work with apples, you start to like see similarities within varieties. And so of those 100 varieties that we have, you can take, you know, you can, you could throw them into four distinct categories and 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 then you know you have your sharp category, you have your tannic category, you have your aroma category, you know, and and whatever else. So right. so you then you know where the apples fit as far as the categories. And so with the example of of Workman Dry, I know that what makes that cider's style is a high percentage of the tart apple varieties and especially the crab apples. So depending, it doesn't matter really what varieties I have, as long as I have some, and I always do of those, I'm going to knock on wood. (laughs) But but, uh, yeah, so, so the blends, um, so, so obviously the blends are always different, but the attempted style is the same for some of the ciders that we make every year. So you have essentially sort of flavor profiles within groups of different apples so you know like a a bunch of sharps a bunch of more tannic a bunch of things like that that they they're going to have nuances but they're going to have dominant flavor profiles that you can use when you know one of that member of that group is not available exactly Um, you can use another one exactly got it yeah that's nice i got another benefit of diversity yeah it's like yeah for sure um, if you know if somebody's looking uh so you know, and I asked about your cider making, but and, and I, I know we just started down that, but it, it makes me think um, while we're in the orchard, I wondered if you 
wanted to share a little bit about just your your like a a skill like grafting like what what goes into that like what are you do you what have you learned <laughs> from the many years that you've been doing this that how 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 could you teach us how to graft uh, without showing us yeah that's hard to do um okay uh, but i will <laughs> I'll, I'll try uh, yeah for sure it's um yeah well well grafting is like it's one of those things that is much easier than it than it seems because here's an example i often use like if if a windstorm breaks a branch but it doesn't break it off and it's just hanging by half of the cambium mm-hmm. the other half that's broken if it's in close contact it will heal and reconnect so essentially mm. that's what you're doing when you graft you are you're you're making um a similar cut on two different plant parts making essentially a jigsaw puzzle where they fit together and it, and it's very important to match the diameter of the two branches or the rootstock and the branch, whatever you're grafting. And, and the, the key is that the cambiums touch. The cambium layer is the actively growing tissue of the tree. And then, so once you, once you, once you do that, then you just have to keep um, it from drying out, which is done with wax or paraffin tape, um, and and then you just give it time and it'll heal. So so that's how you basically take the genetics because um, I should probably mention apples do not grow true to type. So if you take a seed from a Honeycrisp apple and plant it in the ground, it will it will always be a cross between the mother tree, which is the tree that bore the fruit, and whatever pollen came and pollinated the flower that turned into that apple. So the, the, the seeds in any apple are crosses. And right. so when you plant the seed of a Honeycrisp apple, it will be a cross of Honeycrisp and wherever the pollen came from that pollinated that flower. So the only way to plant more Honeycrisp trees is to take cuttings. Essentially, you're essentially cloning the tree right. and you're grafting it onto other rootstock or other branches and, and then growing out those genetics. So- now- um, yeah, so that's um, when you take those cuttings is important, isn't it? Do you need to do it during dormancy? Yeah, that's true. Yep. Okay. Um, yes, I, I've, yeah. I've seen recently. You said to match the diameter, but I've seen recently somebody getting fancy with like they sort of topped, you know, like pollarded a, an apple tree and then put these four little uh, graphs in around the, you know, at the cambium layer around that sort of, you know, six inch diameter cut yeah. wound that's on the top. And so you have like, you can graft in at the edge of those, at the edge of that sliced off, topped off right. tree. Is that, yeah. is that another, is yeah. that where is, we're getting more advanced there? Yeah, I should have mentioned that though, but that, that's true. Like, so um, there's, there's a couple different types of grafting. The one that I just described is mostly called whip and tongue. And then what you're describing is either cleft grafting or um, bark grafting, where you take, you know, you can take the whole top off of a tree and have a eight inch diameter, you know, trunk and slip the little scion twigs in between the cambium layer and the hardwood, mm. you know, in, in multiple places on the top of that cut tree. And, um, and that is, is an excellent way to top work a um, older tree. And so that, again, it's the same thing, basically connecting the cambium and protecting essentially the scion, because the scion, you have to remember, is not connected to a root system, so it can Mm. dry out. You basically have to protect the scion from drying out. You have to give it enough time to make that connection to heal so that it can so that it can keep itself from drying out. And that's 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 the key. So, yeah. So timing is very important. And. um with top working, there's a there's a short window of time um, when the tree starts to grow in the early spring, but it's not too warm out, but it's warm enough that it's going to push the buds of the cyan wood and it's going to promote the healing process. So that typically is right around bloom or just before bloom with apples. Um, gotcha. That's when you would do that. And then, you know, um, there's also budding, which is something where you take the formed buds in august off of a tree so the 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 new growth like what is growing right now 
when it starts oh, after pollination. Yeah, when it starts to form the buds for next year, which happens in July and August, you can you can take you can cut just the little bud out of the branch and then slip yeah. it into another part of a tree or a rootstock and and then allow that to heal allow the, you're allowing the dormant bud to heal um on the bark or the rootstock of the new tree that you're growing and it and it heals and it stays dormant and then next spring that bud will grow and so the the little bit of genetics that is in that one bud will over the course of you know however many years it is turn into a whole tree and have and have that genetic material so that's another way of grafting fun <laughs> yeah i love it um Okay, sorry. Uh, just a little <laughs> diversion. Wanted to learn from the master. Um, <laughs> so uh, back to back to the cellar then. So you this is so your workmen. You were describing that um, yeah. and and how you achieve consistency from year to year. Is that a goal for you to always be consistent in your in your name? You know, in that whatever it is that you're making, whether you know, or do you have do you, do you like like if it's called the same thing? If it's workmen's, you want it to be workmen's every year, but then you play with other things under different labels yeah, how do you how do you yeah. handle that i imagine diversity and yeah. and consistency don't always go together right exactly yeah so there's what is there maybe five <clears throat> five five uh ciders that we attempt to make every year and then there's a <laughs> whole nother handful that really just get made in that one particular year and that's like um whatever the year gives you know it's always different um there'll be a handful of ciders that are just unique to that season. And when they're gone, they're gone. And, and I kind of love that because, um, cause they're special, you know, for instance, last year yeah. we had a very big crop last year and we had lots of um, great apples and there were, you know, maybe, you know, 20 varieties that we had a pretty substantial quantity from those 20 varieties and so we made um, seven different ciders that were of only two or three varieties. And, and those were intended to be like showcasing what those two or three apples together could be. And so we did that last year, but there's no way we're going to be able to do that this year because we have a small crop and we may never do it again. So it's sort of, um, I like to think that each year has its own uniqueness and that's kind of part of the artistry of the winemaker or the cider maker is to kind of um, harness that and uh, showcase that. So that's, that's like more than 50% of what we make are essentially ciders that will never be made again. <laughs> and, and, uh, <laughs> nice. Yeah. And I, and I, and, and, and I like to think that I like to think that people that enjoy drinking our cider will just come to um, enjoy that, you know, that, Right. Diversity. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like an advertisement to join your wine club. If anything. <laughs> Please. <laughs> your cider club. <laughs> uh, if you want to taste those things that you can only have one time and then they're gone forever, uh, <laughs> yeah. join the club. Please do. Uh, well, and your, uh, can you describe what your philosophy of winemaking is? Uh, or, yeah, I say winemaking. I, yeah. I use that interchange interchangeably, but yeah. cider making. Yeah. And then, and sort of then how does that work itself out in actual your approach? Yeah. Right. Well, I'm actually glad that you, that you call it winemaking because I, for one, feel like I never actually left the wine industry. I feel like I just went in this particular direction. So, I feel like yeah. I'm still making wine. Um, it just so happens to be with apples. And so, yeah, yeah kind of what I said earlier about, you know, what I learned working with Herman and working with Rob Thomas, um, that was influential. So I think that that really my goal with how I pr approach cider making, wine making is, again, to kind of guide, basically guide the fruit to juice and then to a fully fermented cider. That's the first, like that to me, that's the first step before you think at all about aging or how you're going to finish it or how you may blend it. So, so with cider, we have this process called sweating the apples, which is different than winemaking with grapes. Um, and so yes. 
<laughs> so yeah, so so another it's fortunate, right? We're able to to sit on the harvested apples and um it but it is it is something that you have to keep your eye on too, because especially in the early part of fall when it's still warm out. Um right. basically basically my opinion on sweating is that you're you want the you first of all, scientifically you want the starches that are still in the apples to be converted to sugars. Mm-hmm. But also I feel like there's this thing that happens with the aroma of the apples when they sit. And, um, you know, when you, when you walk into a, a cooler of apples, or if you're just around, you know, apple crates outside, you know, the, the, uh, the aroma is intense, you know, you're getting all those different flavors and it's so beautiful. I mean, it's just so much, so much, um, scent. And so when you think about, you know, those flavor compounds are being released is there a time when you've released too many or is there a time when they change you know when it right. when, when it changes from kind of the um you know the like grassy lime lemon to the raspberry and then further to the ripe peach and then eventually to the you know like bruised apple where right. in that spectrum is it important for you as the cider maker to harness that flavor so so that's something that i feel like there really hasn't been a lot of scientific research on um and i feel like it's like wide open it's really it could be really cool to see how you know if you could get a control like you know a certain apple variety and then somehow sweat it differently and then press it see see what i see how it changes Oh, that does sound like a fun experiment. Yeah. It sounds like a good Cornell uh, student project. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so anyway, uh, yeah, the sweating is, is very important um, as far as I feel. And then, so basically, yeah, you, you, you pull the apples out of the orchard, you sweat them, you make your first decision of when to press. And, and for me personally, I like to try to make most of the blend at the press so if I'm making, you know, Workman Dry, for instance, again, I might, you know, gather up, you know, if I have a certain time of the year and I've got all these Roxbury russets and all these Newtown Pippins and these Doggo crabs and all this other stuff, I'm just going to put them all together and press them together. So it's sort of like the first initial blending is basically done right there at the press. Mm. And I feel like the more I the more I make cider, the more I can almost get that like, right, like right there. Like, um, like that's, um, you know, in the, in the, in the kind of like thinking of, you know, hands off, you know, or even like you you go to like, you know, you're thinking about like gravity, gravity for, or, you know, gravity wineries and all that kind of thing. Like if you can do that, I feel like if you can do that, that blending at the press, you're, reducing the need to monkey around with the cider further down the road when it might be de- detrimental. Right. Ah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. So, so I try to do that and then, um, and then for as hands off as I am, you might be surprised to know that I do not do wild yeast fermentations, but I don't. I, I just discovered that and I was, I was surprised, but I mean, it, you know, I don't, I'm not dogmatic about these things, yeah. but I, I'm curious to hear your, your philosophy about yeah. that, how that plays in. Yeah. I, I, first of all, respect anyone that does it. And I think it's really cool. I love, I love the idea of, of calling the wild yeasts, you know, the indigenous yeasts in your, in your orchard or vineyard, you know, part of the terroir. I love that idea. Um, for me, um, long ago, I, did some yeast experiments with cider and discovered that DV10 champagne yeast was the yeast that gave me the like fruit forward, elevated aromas, um, you know, somewhat austere, you know, kind of slaty, like, and I, and I love that. It's like that, um, you know, it's just like tart, you know, mouth quenching kind of characteristic. And so I've used DV10 for every fermentation, you know, for the last, uh, you know, 15, 20 years. And um, I'm always happy with the results. But more so, I think the, the cool thing I think about it is that it's almost like a baseline control in the whole process. And so I can, you know, evaluate differences in variety. And if I'm working with 
fruit from other orchards, I can evaluate terroir by taking the yeast component out of the equation or essentially making it a control in the, right. in the process. Right. So, um, so that's been, uh, it's been fun for me to be able to do that, to kind of see, um, you know, the, the differences within cider and, and have less variables between varieties or between orchards. So that's really my yeah. main, that's my main reasoning for it. Um, yeah, I think that makes, yeah. that's, a, that's a, you know, that makes a lot of sense for that. Yeah. I, I, I like, I like that. And, and I, I mean, I, I'll, I'll throw a, yeah. my, you know, I mean, the reason no, well, I don't know what I'm trying to say, but other than I, I wish that the one thing that I don't like about the natural wine, uh, the impact of natural wine is the sort of judgmentalism about what happens in the cellar. Um, and I know that that is like a defining characteristic of it. So it's sort of like you do have to, you know, if you're going to call yourself something and, and that's defined by, you know, not adding anything, then great. You do have to sort of draw a line there. Yeah. Um, I just I just wish there was less. I guess that's why I say judgmentalism. It's not like it's, you know, like, you know, you aren't claiming to be natural. You're just making cider. So it's like, yeah. but I, I wouldn't want you to be looked down on because I think your methods are perfectly reasonable for anybody that wants to listen and understand what you're trying to do, you know? Um, and all, and the other thing is I just, you know, me personally, it's like, well, not me personally. I mean, the, the statement that I will make is the decisions that anybody makes in the cellar are personal and philosophical. And the decisions that you make in the vineyard or orchard are global and environmental. And that's Mm -hmm. where I think our emphasis should be. Like, that's where I think we need to really be focusing our attention and great. Like I love that there's all these different philosophical styles that express themselves in the cellar, but what is really important here? It's not those personal choices that don't impact anybody. It's the global environmental decisions of what we put into our world and how we treat it. So I don't know. That's my personal (laughs) bent on the whole thing. I like that. Um, I I have to admit that I have a little bit of a complex for not being a natural a natural <laughs> well that's what i mean yeah like i don't want you to yeah. um you know like i think it's uh, uh you know I, and i'm sure a lot of natural wine advocates listen to this so i you know that's why i want to say this you know i just yeah. think it's important to me to, to really understand where our, our, our emphasis should be like i i love everybody's choices in the cellar you know i because I, to me they're unimportant you know as long as you end up with the, something i enjoy drinking right um uh, you know, obviously, I I appreciate the philosophy of not wanting to over manipulate, and you know that you, you know for me the, that that the idea of natural to me I feel like would would be better served if it meant protecting and showcasing what goes on in the vineyard or orchard um, rather than such an adherence to the the style uh, of, uh, in the cellar that you know you you can actually screw up <laughs> like what happened all the great work and all of the good choices that went before that potentially um but you know i mean there's a philosophy about that as well so i you know i'm not trying to debate it at all in this moment but yeah just to say you know like yeah. where our emphasis should be in my opinion is on global environmental impact decisions and those aren't the decisions that happen in the cellar yeah um and i and, and i will say too actually um i i i don't sulfite until after primary fermentation. So I like to think that my fermentations are actually a co-fermentation with the wild and the DV10. Obviously the DV10 is right. is going to overpower and be the more dominant culture, but I am not in any way trying to inhibit the wild yeast that is naturally there. So um I mean and I have, Does that mean no sulfites? No sulfites until after primary fermentation. Got it, right more yeah just protecting yeah. right rather allowing, than preventative allowing yeah. whatever is naturally there to do whatever it's going to do got um, it and do you know, any other what other strange choices do you make in the cellar <laughs> 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 just kidding no i mean what other you know what you know what would what are some other characteristic choices that you make I yeah the other, the other thing the other thing that i do that um i've had some conversation with folks about is I, when I, when I finish the cider, well, like maybe I'll, well, yeah. When I finish the cider, I, I finish it in many different ways. I make traditional method ciders. I make, um, you know, ciders that go through secondary in the bottle that I do not disgorge. You know, the yeast that's in there has a, um, 
benefit. It has a, an, an addition to the flavor characteristics. Mm-hmm. Um, I make still ciders and I also make uh, forced carbonated ciders. And I've, I've, you know, some, some of my friends, um, a lot of my, a lot of my cider making compadres do not force carbonate because of different philosophies. But I feel like, yeah. I feel like forced carbonating is another really cool tool. Like it, it has this really unique and, and it has a bad rap because it's associated with inexpensive, you know, soda pop and inexpensive wine coolers, right. but, but it has this really cool, um, influence on, on the cider. It's like, so, so the workman dry is the example of this where, like I said, I make the, the blend at the press as much as I can. Um, it goes through primary fermentation, Upon first racking, I might add 50 or 60 parts per million uh, sulfur, uh, p- potassium metabisulfite, and then allow, allow it to naturally clarify, and then very simply rack it a second time directly into a bright tank and force carbonate it, and it's done. So it's like like if you want to talk about like hands off, right? That is right. is I mean the, the only thing that's more hands off is to just bottle it as still. Which I do, right. I do that. I do that too, but um, but but for me, the force yeah. the force carbonating is this tool, a technique that further lifts um, the aromas and that bright fruit character. It like further. Mm. Um, it it's like it's like that that technique is so in line with the types of apples that I choose for that cider that it it. Um, exaggerates even more so that style that I'm trying to produce. So it's not like the, like a secondary fermentation in that scenario would elevate the alcohol a little bit. It would create this secondary sort of um, yeast character flavor component that is really good in some cases, but in this particular instance, it isn't. Um, so that's, so to me, it's, it's another great tool in producing this certain type of cider that I'm trying to produce. And again, I have a complex about that as well. Um, probably because I'm a sensitive guy, but I'm also just sort of a, a little bit, I, I guess I'm just Lord, a little bit. Um, I just have a problem sometimes with um, blanket statements around quality, right? That's, that's the term. Mm. That's the term. So, yeah. so I like to think that, um, the artistic freedom is really important. And so, you know, each, each winemaker or cider maker, you know, they, they go on their own path and they do things how they wish. Um, I think it's a good exercise to um, continue to explore, you know, and, and, um, and maybe think about what you may or may not be doing because of, you know, who knows. I hear you talking about this, you know, having a complex about these things. But I mean, I think the the good news is, and, and maybe this is just a testament to, you know, the work that you do in your vineyard. I, mean, I keep saying vineyard orchard interchangeably, but in your orchards, um, you know, I had been recommended to talk to you by multiple of your peers there in New York, and everyone spoke of you with the greatest respect, and nobody had any caveats <laughs> in their praise of you. So just so you know. Yeah. Um, you, you know, your, your reputation is not, uh, dinged by you being experimental <laughs> in these ways that are yeah. not considered natural or thank whatever. You, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. No. And, uh, yeah. And, and I mean, the, I, what else can I say? I can say other good things, but I, I, I want to jump back to a couple questions because you brought up using biodynamic preps. Yeah. You, you mentioned using copper and I know that you're, you've been certified biodynamic for a while. Um, so I know, I mean, copper is one of the main criticisms of organic about, you know, why we who espouse these philosophical, you know, proclivities for low impact agriculture by using organic biodynamic, you know, philosophies, we get dinged because they can point to copper and be like, that's just as bad, if not worse than some of the stuff that's considered conventional. Um, is it the only option that you have in those cases that you're using it? What, what is your approach to using copper? I mean, obviously you use it. So I'm just wondering how you feel generally. I I only use, 
Um, I've come to only using one product, which is called Cueva, which is a copper soap, and it has a it advertises a much lower metallic copper content than a lot of the other copper products. So there's that. Yeah. There's that okay. that I that when you really do the the math, the amount of of um, heavy metal that you're introducing into the environment is very low. The amount that I spray it is is very uh, minimal, especially when you compare that to the amount of spraying that conventional orchards and vineyards need to do with products like Captan and Mencozeb, which Captan is a carcinogen and Mencozeb is an extreme aquatic pollutant. Those two products, I would, I'm not a chemist, but I would tend to say those two products are significantly more harmful to human health and to the environment compared to copper. Mm -hmm. Um, the other thing is, um, you know, I, you know, the, when you have a, either a conventional or organic orchard or vineyard that is in need of constant spraying, that's when you have to constantly spray. And the more you wean right. away from that, the more you allow, um, you know, microbial diversity and um, competitive microbiology to colonize the leaf surfaces and therefore you 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 don't have this the same pressure so like i said earlier i've sprayed copper four times i've sprayed a total of two and a half gallons of cueva upon my four acres this season which is such a small amount and um and so that so that's my argument and 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 i feel like with organic if you're if you're doing organic and you're also thinking about, you know, your gen the general health of the orchard, the microbiological diversity, et cetera, et cetera. You should be moving in the direction of less and less and less inputs. So, so therefore, you're you're moving towards a more sustainable agricultural system where, as heavily sprayed either organic or conventional orchards and vineyards are just continuously perpetuating that the need for that management and that's right. and that's um and that i think is more harmful to the yeah. future and it's it's probably important to draw that distinction between organic or, or even biodynamic for that matter by the letter of the law of of getting those certifications which really can look in its worst case just like conventional agriculture just substituting the sprays for different sprays um and then another kind of <laughs> organic or biodynamic approach, which is really a, a thoughtful concern and wanting to do what you just talked about, which is constantly reduce inputs and build a ecosystem that is, you know, full of vitality and, and you know, has its own internal mechanisms for, um, you know, taking care of itself yeah. uh, that, that reduce human input of those, any kind of chemicals. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I absolutely. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, the there is that option of somebody who wants to get certified and just sort of follow the letter of the law and not, you know, be any more thoughtful about it than that. Yeah. Um, so it's, yeah, it's good to, and I don't I'll know what the solution that, to that is. I'll say too that the, um, the biodynamic uh, certification with Demeter, part of their certification process is sort of looking at your farm and seeing that you are moving in that direction and seeing that mm, you are, okay. you have yeah, like that's, that's holistic really management in mind. And, um, and, you know, so that is, that is one of the differences between USDA organic and biodynamic certification is the, yeah, and the holistic thinking and the moving, like, like not every biodynamically certified farm is self-sustaining, but it's important that you're moving in that direction. Right. Or uh, regen I, I should add, yeah, regenerative organic certification has that component as well. Oh, good. Uh, where it's, you know, where you, I think the the end goal for regenerative organic certification is sort of this, you know, a, 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 an ideal that may be unreachable for anybody, but it gives, you know what I mean? It's yeah. that thing where you can constantly improve. And so that that's the idea is to set this super high bar and then encourage and incentivize people to continually move towards it knowing that we're all somewhere on the process that there are minimum levels you need to reach to be actually 
responsible, but then you have a, a range to, you know, move in the right direction above that as yeah. well. Yeah, for sure. Um, and and I've been even sustainable certification. And like if you that that has a similar thing where there's like grade levels. I mean, I'm I'm not saying too much good about them because they do they they have a much lower bar. I think yeah. I think it's best to have sustainable in combination with organic certification because then at least you're you're removing most of the bad stuff as well as getting on track for all these other aspects. It's almost I think that's almost what regenerative organic looks like is a combination of those two sort of yeah. Um but so talking of speaking of biodynamics, so if if somebody went to your website right now on the homepage you have this very interesting video um of you and Dave a sort of talking about your 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 feelings of confliction about having biodynamic certification at this point in history and and you know having gotten into the history of Steiner and his views and uh you know things surrounding that it's it's a troubling and complicated thing to say the least in some cases i mean you know it could be uh very clearly troubling <laughs> in yeah. some cases yeah. um what uh, and and i mean and that's that's one aspect of it i've i've heard other criticisms obviously of of biodynamics that you know probably are along the lines of analogizing it to something like astrology where it's sort of you know a, a hocus pocus based you know junk science kind uh, of i thing am an astrologer no, no. too adam okay great <laughs> <laughs> there we go you're the perfect person to talk to about this then <laughs> um so please like how you know i would love you to talk about all that honestly and i don't even know what the question is other than yeah. you know how you clearly are aware of of some of the the complications and troubling aspects of the history of biodynamics and its founder and then you're you know you clearly embrace other aspects of it and so i just wonder is you i know this weighs on you because you did a video about it and felt the need for both of you to speak about it so what what's that all about yeah i'm glad you're bringing this up um yeah so i mean i guess it's important to mention um i stumbled upon biodynamics when i was working in vineyards you know 15 years ago and went to a biodynamic viticulture conference and um really really was amazed by kind of the uh, the differences of the mentality, the philosophy, what people were thinking, how they were approaching agriculture. And I loved it and I jumped right in and sort of blindly just practiced it and and mostly practiced it, you know, just me and 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 not like really engaging with anybody else around it. And um and kind of found it to be kind of just that, like more of this sort of um spiritual way to engage with the earth and to engage with farming like it was kind of a cool um so the spiritual aspect was part of the attraction totally. actually not yeah. it wasn't a turn off for you no yeah nice. it was very okay yeah very much so and so it wasn't until you know after doing this for maybe 10 years that deva who my wife and business partner who she her father was involved in the Theosophical Society in the 70s. And he had some Steiner books that Deva had, you know, carried on. He passed away in the 70s. And she she brought forth this book that Steiner wrote um, about color that had some very racist remarks in it. And it was shocking. Mm. And um and I and like, you know, whoa, what is this? Wow. And so that was kind of my first um, realization that maybe I don't know the whole story. And I mean, and I, and I, and to be honest, I'd never really had even attempted to look into the story. I just enjoyed practicing biodynamics. And so, yeah. and um, you know, and then some other things came out recently about biodynamics um, connection with Nazis and, mm. and the Nazi culture, although that happened after Steiner passed, but still it raises these questions of what was Steiner's intention around biodynamics and everything else that he philosophized about. And it's hard to know because he's not alive. And, you know, he he passed away in, I think, the late 20s or early 30s. So there's not a ton of information around um I don't know him as a person other than, you know, what he did, what he studied. 
So, so for me personally, I mean, I feel like I'm going through a exploration. I think, I think for, for Deva, she's kind of more, um, you know, kind of settled on, on her thoughts, but for me, I'm kind of going through an exploration of, first of all, like what, <clears throat> what does it mean when you learn something about somebody that you didn't know before, but you can't like ask the questions or, um, or what, um, mm. you know, does it, does it blatantly disregard, like if, if biodynamics was formed around this idea that there are hierarchical layerings to humans and culture, <laughs> then right. I'm out, you know, like that's, right, right. that's it. I'm done. But, um, I if guess, that was incidental to the creation, like if, that, yeah. if his philosophy around these racist ideas was incidental and, and just a one part of his life. And then on the other side, he had these, yeah. these you know, agricultural ideas. Yeah. Maybe that's not as big of a deal. Right. And so I, I, I mean, there's one side of me that feels like, okay, I owe it to everyone that was harmed to just say, you know, I'm no longer a part of this. <clears throat> and then there's another side of me that, thinks more along the lines of, you know, it is a unique perspective on agriculture and it has offered a beautiful perspective that a lot of people have gravitated towards. Can that be separate? If, if, if the racist idealism did exist within Steiner and his, and his culture, can biodynamics actually be separate from that? And I know some people would say absolutely not. And yeah, um, it's, and that's it's such that's, a timely Sorry, go ahead. Please. Uh, I was going to say that's that's kind of the to me and for for who I am, my personality. That's the tough question that I'm that I'm wrestling with. Well, it's such a timely uh, problem to wrestle with. I mean, as we all sort of look back at the you know the founding of this country and the the people uh, that have been revered, you know, as founders, um, and they're very complicated. Uh, and in some cases, not complicated and bad uh, relationship with race. And I certainly don't have the final word to say about any of these. I'm just asking questions. So yeah, and um, I think, and I think that to me, like, I think it's very important to just be thinking about it, right? Like, I think, yeah. I think it's wrong to, um, it's wrong to just say no, that didn't happen. It's important to think about it. It's important to to listen to other people, and I hope that that from this very conversation, um, <clears throat> other people can reach out to me or you and 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 give us information because I would love to I would love to dive more deeply into understanding you know biodynamics and specifically Rudolf Steiner and his thoughts. Yeah, and well, and so yeah. so I I think it's important to be thinking about it. Um, and I don't mean any disrespect for not acting sooner if there are those out there that feel that I that I should have. Um, but it's it's complicated in that I that I, you know, I, I'm 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 intending I'm intending to do the right thing. Yeah, no. And I and I hope that uh, I mean, this is my hope that we can ask these questions and explore these things and have a sense that, you know, nobody's perfect as right. well. I mean, not to forgive yeah. the things that were bad, which were absolutely uh, wrong. And, and, and yet to understand that, like, I, I mean, one of the, the jokes that I often make is like, you know, I started this podcast two years ago and it's really hard for me to listen to myself from then or from five minutes ago because my mind has already changed and I already think I was an idiot for what I thought. Yeah. And, um, what other big ideas are you grappling with? <laughs> what uh, what else have you, you know, come upon? Doesn't have to be as as uh, you know as, as 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 fraught with you know historical ramifications, but just in you know, it could be so, uh, something that has caused you wonder lately in the in the orchard or otherwise. Well, I've been, I mean, uh, yeah, I don't, <laughs> I've been um, experimenting a lot with. Um, with with the moon and the moon cycles within right orcharding yeah i was really fascinated to read the sort of journal entries that you have been recording yeah. and so what are some can you talk about some of the experiments or observations that you're recording yeah well it's um you know like um we all we all understand the moon's effect on tides 
and um, you know, it actually the moon's gravity actually bulges the Earth. It's not just the water. The water is influenced, but the actual land itself is bulging, like the the, the mm. actual matter of Earth. So the moon's influence on Earth, you know, is scientifically known. Um, you know, our bodies are seventy percent water. Plants, I don't. They're similar or, or, or even more. You know, there's a lot of um, to think that the moon is not influencing us and plants and life on Earth at the same time is um, kind of a ridiculous thought. So it's been it's been, you know, um, using the moon or other astrological um, planets to aid in agriculture has been going on for thousands of years within basically all cultures throughout the world. And um, and I think there's a lot there that that can be explored. And, you know, specifically, there was some pretty extensive research done by a German woman, Maria Thun, um, mm -hmm. with moon phases um, related to growing mostly vegetables. Um, so, so lately I've been thinking about what's specifically relating to perennial crops and, and obviously specifically apples, you know, how could we understand the moon's influence and then work with that more within um, growing apples? And, and again, the, the ultimate goal is, like I said earlier, like a low input, no spray orchard. I mean, is there a way that certain timing of, of either, you know, biodynamic preparations or, um, irrigating your trees or pruning or who knows what um, could be done at a more beneficial time if we understand the way the moon is influencing those plants that we're working with. And I, and I, I'm really interested, I know it's like a long-term project, but um, I'm interested in just kind of going down that rabbit hole and uh, exploring, yeah. exploring that. So, so not only just like within the orchard itself, but also with like planting trees and, uh, you know, seedling, seedling apple trees and, um, all that. I think that if nothing else, I mean, the other thing, you know, you, you brought up the cynicism around astrology earlier and uh, right, that's, right. that's the common, you know, that's the common, um, you know, reaction. Right. And I meant it that way. <laughs> this is the common perspective, yeah. not, not yeah. in any critical way right. of you. Right, right, right. But um, but I think that uh, I think that if it is this this is the way I think about it. If it is com if if the um, effects of the moon on agriculture is so minimal that it's not worth even like toying with, I'm actually okay with that because just the um, the study and the engagement of the moon itself and and the other planets is fun in and of itself. It's just great to know kind of what's going on in the sky so that. If that is all it is, that is all it is. It's worth mm. doing. So I enjoy I enjoy that aspect of uh, trying to understand. Yeah, yeah, I get that. That's uh, the that like I I get the appeal too. Yeah, I mean that's that is does sound fun actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Well, how how can people um, taste some of this cosmic juice? <laughs> that <laughs> where where can how what is is there do you do any direct sales or do you do any tastings? We do. Um, we have a, we have a cider club, which we love. We, we send out okay. uh, three or four times a year to that. So if you're interested, please join okay. our cider club. We love our cider club members. Um, get good discounts and all that. Um, we do three local farmers markets in the Finger Lakes area. And we're in local wine shops and restaurants and bars, etc. And we, do intend we we do we do tastings by appointment although um, it's just Deva and I so we are very limited and um, yeah. it's really kind of like generally speaking July August September and maybe October if we're not too busy we will be available you know at least one of of either Saturday or Sunday to um, to set up an appointment with folks and we're trying to make that a little easier. Um, you know, online so people can actually physically sign up. But to date, it's really been sort of like, uh, you know, just give me a call and tell me when you can make it and we'll we'll try to schedule something. So um, that's really, uh, that's what kind of like the best way to to get a hold of us and see what's going on around here. And and I will say too, I'm, I'm 
you know, I love to just chat with people. I really, I really do. It's great to um, spend an hour with somebody and, you know, just go into detail. Me too. (laughs) In case you hadn't noticed. (laughs) Um, No, that's great. And yeah, thank you for that. I thank you for this chat. It's been it's been great. I really enjoy getting to know you and what you're doing. I see I see where the hype comes from. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Any parting words or anything? Oh, I want to say your website, which is uh red well, you can say it. Red bird with a Y orchard cider. There I said it. Um <laughs> R-E-B-Y-R-D, not B-I-R-D, orchardcider.com. That is correct. And that's probably the best place. Do you have social media that you want to promote or anything yeah we do um facebook instagram yeah you um you know you can find us i think yeah look for red bird with a y yeah um, oh and um for all you california people out there who we admire so much we we did recently get our <laughs> license to ship to california so was that was that a was there a snark in that comment no <laughs> <laughs> And in that, no, <laughs> no I, um. <laughs> I did not intend that. No, no. <laughs> uh, it's awesome. I probably deserve it. We all probably deserve it. <laughs> um, well, thank you again, though. No. Um, that's great. So you'll be able to ship to California. Yeah, we're able to ship to California. And we do love Californians. I, I love it. <laughs> it's, it's a beautiful state. It's a beautiful state. <laughs> Um, <laughs> thank you Eric this has been great yeah really really I love talking to you about all this stuff so thank you for sharing thank you Adam appreciate it thanks so much for listening I really hope you enjoyed this as much as I did and if you did please do leave a review for the Organic Wine Podcast it helps a lot and we want to get the word out to as many people as we can which your review will help do thanks so much <laughs>